So, <coughs> it's festival season, so today is the auspicious disappearance of uh, Srila Haridas Thakur, the Namacharya. So, we'll just be speaking about Haridas today. Um, there is a description of his passing away in the Chaitanya Charitamrita in great detail in the Anjavila Volume 4. So if you have any chance at all today to just have a look at that, it is very ecstatic. We'll try to get to it, get to it later on. But um, so I'd just like to say what I heard about Harry Dustakor. So what we uh, our pronouns. <coughs> In the morning, a lot of the times include Sri Namacharya Haridas Thakur. I heard Rupa say that this morning after Mangalati. So Haridas is the Namacharya. So we know that Srila Prabhupada is the founder Acharya. So the word Acharya is a very, very significant uh, title. So. He was awarded Namacharya because he chanted 300,000 names of Krishna daily. So that translates into 192 rounds per day. <coughs> so that incorporated, that incorporated his day chanting and his night chanting. And he was so immersed in the glories to the holy name because while he was chanting Krishna was manifest on his tongue, his mind was attached to Krishna's pastimes that were happening before him in his, within his mind and he was completely absorbed in the transcendental bliss of uh, chanting the holy name of the Lord. Of course to do that you need to have so many godly qualities that enable you to have that um, potency to be able to perform that type of activity. So uh, we can maybe delve into who Harry Dustakor was so we can understand a little bit more about the personality Harry does. So actually with Harry does, I just want to mention a few more things before we go there. That chanting, once you begin to chant, it, um, on that level, it becomes uncontrollable. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he began to uh, expound the glories of the chanting of the holy names and inaugurate the Sankirtan movement, sometimes he would have that difficulty also that he couldn't stop chanting. So sometimes when he went to an unclean place and <laughs> it was said that uh, it's not good to chant in an unclean place like a, a public amenity or something, he would have to hold his tongue right, to stop chanting. And then there was a pastime there, there's one little boy saw him do that, he goes, why are you doing that? Why are you holding your tongue like that? He said, well, I'm gonna, I, it's not good to chant in a public place, but uh, the boy explained to him that actually chanting is so auspicious that it purifies everything. Just like you have um, the sun's rays, they shine on um, the soil, the nice places, they also shine on dirty places and they purify the dirty places also. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very, very appreciative of that and he nicknamed the boy that you're my guru, so your name is Guru Gopal. So that was very, he was a very um, powerful devotee. So um, sometimes the devotee, <laughs> devotees also get that um, momentum where they begin to chant the holy names of the Lord and sometimes they don't know when to stop uh, and <laughs> sometimes they can't stop and they've got a momentum, they've got a rhythm going and they don't want to stop and that's very ecstatic. Other times it just becomes, sometimes you see it, it's annoying because it's just like it's just a habit that they've formed, like you're having a conversation with some devotee and he's going, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 while you're talking to him. 
excuse me, but will you in so much ecstasy that you can't stop chanting? So it's a rhythmical pattern that we do, but um, when we chant, we have to get on board the chanting. That is the whole process, that while we're chanting, it's uh, not only it's, it's like a mechanical process that we've started, but we listen and we we're attentive to chanting only names, and then it gives us a different momentum where it begins to drive us into the platform of a, a spiritual ecstasy. And when we, we all experience that in some, um, to some degree, sometimes the greater devotees pray that let me chant one good round a day and I'll be so happy if uh, I can execute that. <laughs> so that it is a process. Process means practice. So the, um, we perfect things just like we do any process, like the yoga process, any other yoga process, pranayams or whatever. Just through the practice you perfect it. So through the practice of chanting and avoiding mitigating any offences, uh, then you can achieve that goal where you can uh, taste the nectar of the spiritual nectar of the holy names. So mitigating offences. So I'd like to describe a little bit about Haridas Thakur, how he became who he was. So he was actually Lord Brahma. He's a reincarnation of Lord Brahma. So there is a pastime associated with this <coughs> from the Krishna book where Lord Brahma and the demigods, they knew that this wonderful personality called Krishna had appeared on this earth planet and a lot of demigods regarded Krishna as their worshipful Narayan. There was a little bit of confusion as to Krishna's real identity as being the Adi Purush, the supreme, original supreme personality, but the demigods that heard about the wonderful pastimes of Krishna and particularly that heard that Akasura demon, one of Kamsa's um, cohorts had come to Vrindavan and there was going to be a confrontation. So the demigods all went there to, her, to see, to witness this pastime because they were totally afraid Akasura had harassed the demigods and it's said that even the mention of the name of Akasura brought fear into their eyes. So they were all eager to see Krishna dispatch Akasura and as we know who Akasura was it was this big long snake demon eight miles long huge that he actually filled this whole track so he, he mapped out where the boys were going so he parked himself on this track and he opened his mouth so wide it was just like this huge cavern and the boys, <laughs> the, the, all the boys and the cows, they came across it and they go, what is this? Who is this? And they looked at it, wow, it's sort of, they weren't sure if it was Krishna's arrangement, that Krishna arranged something for them to play with or whether it was um, some sort of great big demon maybe but they said ah Krishna will protect us though when inside so then Krishna was powerless to stop him was just like hey let's go inside everybody in you know and then Krishna's left there and of course he knew what was going on so he went inside and then as soon as he went inside the demon shut his jaws and all the demigods are going alas alas oh no he swallowed Krishna achieve what he wanted to achieve but then of course Krishna expanded himself bigger and bigger and he choked Agasura and then um, Agasura exploded and when he exploded Lord Brahma saw this it was quite instantaneous and all the demigods were amazed and then they saw the soul of Agasura merge into Krishna's body so Brahma was rather um, intrigued that this is my worshipful Narayan so he began to follow Krishna further down the line so of course Brahma was in Vrindavan and in Vrindavan um, there's no Mahamaya there's just Yogamaya potency 
So Yoga Maya's potency works on everyone. So it was working on Lord Brahma also that he was becoming bewildered like who was this boy, particularly when they all stopped a bit further down the line and the boy said, we're hungry and they start to have a picnic. So then they brought out their lunches and to his um, sort of amazement that uh, when they started to eat, they would take a bite out of something like some blood and say, oh, Krishna, this is so nice. Here, taste this. And in Vedic injunctions, as some people already know, that that is just, um, you don't do that. It's called unclean food. It's called um, utista. Uh, that's food that's been spoiled because it's already been in someone's mouth. Yet the boys were putting it in Krishna's mouth, he said, and Krishna was doing the same thing to the boys, they're all sharing this food. So Lord Brahma said, this can't be possible, he can't be Lord Narayan, there's a whole lot of ceremony that goes with this um, offering of foodstuffs to Narayan, so maybe he's not. So in his bewilderment, he actually tried to, he tried to test Krishna, and we know the story that he stole the boys, uh, uh, he's, first he stole the cows and the boys go, oh, it's all very quiet, where, is, where are the cows? Krishna said, oh, I'll find them, don't worry, and then when you come back the boys were gone. But this was also a leela that Yoga Maya arranged because when Krishna found that everybody was missing, he replaced himself um, as the cows and the boys, so the Supreme Personality got it was in the form of the boys and all the cows. So all the car mothers, the cow mothers, they got to experience having spring personnel, got it sucking their teeth and you know associating with them and all the coward men and coward um, ladies, the gopas, they had the spring personality of Godhead uh, at home right, for one year. So while that was happening, uh, there was uh, so much affection going down that Balaram one day, he was standing on New Govardhan. Well, <laughs> not New Govardhan, I wish he was standing on New Govardhan. He was standing on the original Govardhan hill. And he saw something really strange that the um, coward boys, they had the little calves, and all of a sudden the calves escaped from their clutches and they come running down to the mums and the mums were down the bottom and the, they were mooing and they ran up and they were started licking they started to lick their calves and instead of the boys chasing um, or instead of the boys chasing the, oh, what happened is that the gopas were there also and then they they come and collected their boys and they start to hug their boys and smell their hair and there's all this affection going on and Balaram said, Krishna, this is really strange. What's happening here? And Krishna had to explain to him, actually, Lord Ram took the cows and the boys, so I had to expand myself. And of course, we know when Lord Brahma came back, he saw all the cows and the cowards, and he'd hidden, he'd hidden uh, all of the boys and the cows in Mount Sumeru, which was well, a few yojanas away, but they were there and he checked. They were still there, and then he come back again, and then when he come back, he saw the forearm forms. Not only one Narayan, but he saw so many different Narayans all over the place there. And he goes, "Oh dear!" <laughs> he realised he'd made a really grave mistake that he'd been playing um, tricks on the supreme personality of Godhead. So he was very shamefully embarrassed. But then when he went before Krishna, Krishna says, that's fine, and he forgave him. But still within Lord Brahma's mind, he hadn't forgiven himself. So then he went to uh, Godruma Dweep. Now, who knows where Godruma Dweep is? Some of our newer folk here. It's one of the nine islands of Navadweep. And Godruma Dweep is where Lord Chaitanya was born, Nimai was born. So he was performing penances in Godruma Dweep shortly after that. And 
Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared before him and he said, look, I said that it's okay that, you know, there's a, that you're forgiven and everything is good and that actually you'll be appearing in my pastime, in my um, leela when I come as Lord Chaitanya. So at that point in time, Lord Brahma made a request. He said, normally in my position as Brahma, I um, manage everything and I'm in control of so much, but I tend to become puffed up by my prestige in my position, which is a natural thing in the material world. He said, so this time, please let me take very, very humble birth that I don't get puffed up. So, <coughs> consequently, 35 years before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came onto this planet, he took birth as Haridas. Well, he took birth in a, his uh, Muslim family, family meat eaters, and he was born in Bangladesh, just what is Bangladesh now is Bengal at that point in time very close to the border of Bengal. We can go there, it's a, a very, very holy place. And Bhakti Churu Maharaj states that even though it's not <coughs> described in the Chaitanya Charanrita or the Chaitanya Bhagavad, still one um, person who was writing the biography of Advaita Acharya describes that actually <coughs> Haridas met up with Advaita Acharya and Advaita um, gave him the name Haridas because he became um, he um, introduced him into the chanting of the holy names and then Haridas became who he was he took the vow to chant 300,000 names daily it said this makes sense because actually Advaita Acharya is an incarnation of who? Mahavishnu and Sadashiva and Haridas the incarnation of Lord Brahma. So that um, they were very much friends and attached to each other and they used to see each other quite a bit. So then Haridas, because he was born from a Muslim family, was expected that he observe all the different Muslims' rites. But then uh, he began to chant the holy names of the Lord. So he, be he became um, ostracized, not only by the Muslims, but by the Hindus also, because he wasn't following any um, strict Vedic regulations that were required by Hindu Brahmanas. And then the Brahmanas at that point in time, they were very, very segregate even though I was saying that well a Hindu can't become a Brahmin so what's he doing uh, trying to expound the glories of the Supreme Lord where he's not qualified to do so so Haridas he was oblivious of that because he was just completely um, enchanted in chanting the holy names of the Lord and he used to wander about at one point in time he used to go from village to village, so he came to the village where uh, Raghunath Das's father was there, and his his name was Hiranya Govardhan. Hir Raghunath Das is one of the six Goswamis. He wasn't born at that point in time, but Hiranya Das he was a great devotee. So all the devotees to welcome uh, Haridas, but there wasn't many devotees at that point in time because the culture was very, very much uh, Vedic rituals and uh, the Brahman rites and Brahman Brahminical. But Haridas's uh, Iranya Govardhan, he had a Brahman, he was very, very wealthy, as we know. Raghunath Das's father he had so much wealth, it said that Raghunath Das, he had all the opulence of the demigods, so very much well. So his, um, his family priest, whose name was Balram Das, he was uh, a devotee also, and they organized a Sangha where Haridas 
could, uh, was uh, speaking at the Sangha and they invited everybody, they invited all the workers, all the guests, all the Brahmins, everybody was there listening to Haridas expound the glories of the Lord. And while he was talking about it, he was describing uh, the process of mukti. How mukti is so hard to attain that you have to follow all the different rules and regulations and in this Kali Yuga, it is almost impossible to achieve the mukti. But, on the other hand, by chanting the holy name of the Lord, even if it's namabasa, he said namabasa is that's like an indirect chanting, and it's like even with the indirect chanting of the holy name of the Lord, you still get mukti. You get liberation. What to speak of a Sudha nama where you chant it purely, then you get the love of Krishna. So he gave the um, example. There, the example is given that in the Chaitanya Charamrita, um, the Muslim uh, population they don't eat boars or pigs, right? That meat is uh, condemned. So it was said that um, that um, the word or that if the Muslims gets gored by a boar. Sometimes they have these wild boars and they get gored by a boar. And while he was be while the Muslim was being good by boys going hurrah 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 how horrible how horrible I'm being good by a pig but he's chanting the name hurrah so on the strength of that chanting it attains liberation so this was the point that uh, Haridas was making that liberation is available there through even the indirect chanting of the Lord's names what to speak of the chanting that is the highest form of a spiritual realization. So while he was expounding the glories of uh, the names of the holy, holy names of the Lord, uh, certain Brahmins would take an exception to this and there's one Brahmin by the name of Gopal Chakravati who became very much um, offended by what Haridas was saying because it went against everything. He'd learned in Brahman, he'd studied all the Vedas, he knew all the mantras, he um, was expert in um, all the Vedas, as I said. And he became very upset the fact that um, Mukti was being insulted like this, that he, you know, Mukti was so hard to achieve through his process. And it was a challenge to him and all the Brahminical community that their uh, position was being compromised. So he stood up and he said, how is it that you're listening to this Muslim speak all this um, blasphemy against the Vedas? He said, if that possibly could be correct, um, if that if that is not correct, then I curse that your nose will fall off because I know it is not correct that mukti cannot be given just by indirectly chanting the Lord's name. So I curse that your nose will fall off. Everybody was aghast because everybody was enamored by Haridasa's speech except for the Brahmanas. And then Haridas himself, very humble, said, look, if it's wrong, I, uh, I curse that my own nose will fall off like that. So because he made that offensive comment, he was uh, kicked out of the assembly and then within a short period of time, a few days, he, he got leprosy and his, his nose fell off, right? And this is the dangers of offending pure devotee uh, of the Lord like Harry does. So Harry does went from village to village. He went to another place where um, oh, he actually came to Shantipur and Advaita Charya was having a ceremony, a uh, Shraddha ceremony. And then he invited Haridas to the Shraddha ceremony. All the Brahmanas again were there. So this was a constant sort of um, um, situation that Haridas was in. He was not welcome in the Muslim community. In the Brahmana community also hated him because he was uh, preaching what they thought was totally foreign to the philosoph Vedic philosophy. So, um, so what, when he went and played a chariot off him a uh, prime seat, and then when the ceremony was finished, we have what, what is called the Shraddha Putra. It's 
a bit like when we offer the ghee lamp to Srila Prabhupada or to Krishna, then we pass the ghee lamp around and who gets the ghee lamp first? The senior devotees. They give it to the senior devotees out of respect. So therefore Advaita Charya, he offered the Shraddha to Haridas, the core, because he knew he was an amazing devotee of the Lord. But the Brahmanas, they were all lining up because I'm thinking that I'm going to be the most, I'm the most qualified one, I should get this Shadapatra here. So they're all um, waiting in line there, ready to receive it. And then when Haridas received it, they become very uh, offended by this fact that, what, what is this? He's giving it to a Muslim? So they just very much on the bodily level, as you can see, so all their erstwhile education had received, if it was just, um, you know, translated back down to the material level, it was of a very little benefit. So they all got up and they walked out and say, this Advaita Acharya, he's, he's an offender to the Vedic injunctions. How dare he do this? And without waiting for anything, they went home back to their village. And a strange thing happened when they got back to the village that all their fires were out. So the Brahmanas, they subsist of fire because uh, fire, it's said that it's the mouth of the Brahmana that uh, you perform your, all your jagyas through fire ceremonies. And you actually, if you're a really pure Brahmana, you can create fire just by chanting the mantra. Oh, I don't know what the mantra is, Om um, Agni Phut and fire, the fire erupts, you know. Don't know what was happening at that point in time, but there was no fire anyway. And they were starving because they hadn't waited for the um, ceremonial offerings or the prasad or anything. So they said to the wives, cook something, we're very hungry. So the wives went to cook something and their fires wouldn't go either. Right, so then they said, well, let's go to the village and get a fire from the village. All the fires were out in our village, we'll go to another village. So they brought the fire from the other village and that fire went out as soon as they got to their village. So there was no fire in their village. And then they come to the conclusion that we've offended the Dwayne Acharya. So they all went back to the Acharya and apologised to him. He said, no, it's not me that you offended, you offended Haridas the core. So they apologised to Haridas the core and um, took shelter of him. And then Haridas the core, he moved to another place. He moved to somewhere on the outskirts of the village. But once again, um, another Hindu landholder, Ram Chandra, became very uh, upset at the fact that all the people were going to Haridas to court to receive instruction and that the Hindu Brahmin community was complaining about him, that he was uh, taking them away from the rigid study of Vedanta and so on and so forth. So he organised a very beautiful young lady who was prostitute to go and corrupt Haridas to cause values. So this is one of the more famous stories about Haridas where uh, he, um, she arrived and she made her intentions very clear that you're very handsome and I'm very attracted to you and I was just want to take shelter of you and so on and so forth and Harry, so Harry does the call, he said that's very fine uh, I don't mind to do that but there's only one thing of course he knew what was going on that he was being tested and if at any point in time that um, he weakened that he would be killed that the, the Brahmin would discredit him and he'd be um, totally uh, discredited, arrested and killed so he knew that but he said, I just have a few rounds, I have my duties to perform over a set amount of rounds to chant, but once you chant to these rounds, then certainly I will fulfill your desires. So she's sitting there and he's chanting, and of course, the 192 rounds goes well into the night, and he's chanting, he's chanting, and then she fell asleep. And then she woke up in the morning, oh, you fell asleep. But anyway, maybe come back and try tonight. So she went back the second night, she went back the third night 
and the same thing happened. But then by the third night she'd been hearing Haridas the court chant the holy name to the Lord purely and she became totally um, purified in heart and all the unwanted dirty things in her heart, contaminated things just flew out and she confessed to Haridas, I got set up. This Rabbi Chandra come when we do that, he said that's fine. So uh, he initiated her. She took initiation, she stayed in that place and she began to chant uh, I think 300,000 names, shaved the head and she became an aesthetic and then all the village people would also offer her ablations, prashada and everything and Harry thus moved on. So in this way it is said that almost you know, all the time Haridas was being harassed by one or the other. So then um, we have that um, story where he was living on the outskirts of another village and the Nawab, the Muslim ruler, um, brought it to the attention of the Zamindar. Actually, the Zamindar becomes before the Nawab. The Nawab is the king, like Zamindar, saying, there's this Muslim there, he's practicing Hindu rites here. And that's intolerable. Yes, right, that's intolerable. Bring him here. So then the Nawab said to him, it's not, it's not, you just don't, Muslims don't do this. We convert Hindus into Muslims, but no Muslim becomes a Hindu. You cannot do this. You have to stop this uh, chanting that you're performing and you have to adopt the Muslim ways. Otherwise, your future is very, very bleak. You will be whipped in 22 marketplaces. So Harry, <laughs> Harry does, first of all, he said, well, you know, you were converting so many um, Hindus into Muslims, what is one Muslim if he becomes a Hindu? He said that, but he said that it's actually, uh, that is an example that we are not going to show people. So as an example, you can't do this, you know, there's no example of that. So Haridas then confessed, he said that like, it's, in, it's uh, endemic that I cannot stop chanting the holy name of the Lord no matter what. He said, well, we'll put that to the test. So he called in the executioners and then they took him to all the marketplaces, the 22 marketplaces, and they beat him severely. It is said that actually after the first marketplace, normally a person wouldn't survive. But somehow rather, the story unfolds, if I've got time again. So the story unfolds that actually after 22 marketplaces, Harry Das was still alive and he was still chanting. And the executioners were becoming afraid. He said, he said, if the Noah finds out that we couldn't dispatch you, then we'll be killed. So out of his compassion, Harida said, well, okay, what I'll do is I'll um, leave my body. So he went into Samadhi and then his pulse stopped, everything stopped. And uh, by rights he appeared dead. So then they said, well, he is dead, what will we do with him? And then there was this whole um, um, situation where the Hindus said, well, we don't want him, he's, he's, he's not following Hindu ways, so he doesn't deserve to be liberated in the fire. Uh, when he burned up in the fire and Muslims were saying, well, we don't want him, he doesn't deserve to go to heaven by being buried in the ground. We just throw him in the river. And what river was floating past was the Ganga. So they threw him in the Ganga. And for the Vaishnava, that is the most auspicious uh, death the, uh, to be thrown in the Ganga. We always aspire for that. Put that in your will. <laughs> very, very auspicious. So he floated down the Ganga until he got to Shantipur and then he come out of his samadhi and he walked out onto the bank. And the Dwayda Acharya had heard about this um, massive um, miscarriage of misjustice and he was in complete anxiety and then he heard this loud chanting, hey, Krishna, hey, Krishna, coming from the river and he was hurrying us. So he was united with the Dwayda Acharya. So it is said that Haridas went back to that same place where the Nawab was and when the Nawab saw him he 
Where does, why does the goat steady, plead his obeisances and apologise profusely for having done that, understanding the, the greatness of the nature of the personality Hari does? So, later on, when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu began to manifest his pastimes of uh, chanting the holy name of the Lord in Nabhad Dweep, he had so many devotees around him and he had, and he went to a greater, he went to Srinivas's house and it's, he had a Mahaprakash. That means he called all the devotees in, all his intimate disciples, and bestowed upon them the most intimate of blessings according to the mood of devotion. So we have the example of Marari Gupta, who was very much attracted to anyone else? Lord Ram. So he appeared as Ram and Sita in front of Marari Gupta. He called up Kalavecha Shrida, who is one of our one of my favourite personalities in the um, Chaitanya Charitam Rita. He was a coward boy in his uh, last in Krishna Leela, but he was this totally poor banana seller. So we know about Colin Vecha that he was selling banana, banana leaves, bananas, um, the bark from banana trees, and he was just hardly making a living, his roof leaked. But he was just completely absorbed in chanting the holy names of the Lord. And then Nimai Pandit would come along and he'd take some bananas from him and he'd never give him the right price. He said, no, you're charging too much, I'll give you half. Like that. And he'd go to take the bananas back and they'd be wrestling over the bananas. And then <laughs> every day he'd come, he said, you're a learned Brahmin boy, why are you coming to me? He said, oh, I like your products. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu called him up and he said, ask me anything, whatever you like, you know, poor, poor banana seller, no, nothing, no material assets, was it roof leak? And Kalavetsu Chari said, I don't want anything, I'm, I'm happy as I am. Come on, ask something, you've got to ask something. He said, all right, if you're going to, if I have to ask something, I just pray that that little boy Nimoy comes and steals my bananas every day. Pray for that. So then he called up Haridas Thakur. He brought him up and he explained to Haridas, he said, you know, when you took those beatings at the marketplace, he said, I took the beatings for you. And he showed his back, Sri Chaitanya Prabhu showed his back and all the welts were on his back. He said, I covered for you like that. So you wouldn't feel anything. He said, now please ask me a benediction. So then, Hari Dastakur, of course, he didn't want any benediction. He was just happy chanting the Holy Name of the Lord. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu insisted, please, you have to ask. Everybody's getting a benediction. You have to ask for one. So his request was that um, just allow me that in every birth I take, I can eat the remnants of the food from the plates of the Vaishnavas. That, that was his um, request, that he just take the scraps. Of, it didn't even really matter if he was a human being, if he was a dog or an ant, as long as he got the remnants of it. So this is the humility, um, this is the humility of Haridas Thakur that is, um, unbelievably humble and he um, and in that way, in that manner this is um, what enabled him to chant incessantly day and night relish the transcendental nectar of the holy names Trinata Pisa Nichana Tarora Pisa Ishtana which and Lord Chaitanya emphasised that in his prayers more low on the straw and street more told than tree and devoid all sense of false prestige. So after that, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asked Haridas to go to Jagadat Puri. And so then there was the pastimes in Jagadat Puri where Lord Chaitanya 
went on his uh, travels for six years, Maja Lula, and then his son Lula passed on for 18 years, he stayed in Jagadapuri. So Harry Das was there all the time with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then towards the end of Mahaprabhu's stay in Jagadapuri, someone reported to him that Harry Das was feeling a little bit um, jaded. So at that point in time, Harry Das the call was in his 80s and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went there and he said, are you okay? And he said, no, I'm not okay, my body's fine, but my mind is just uh, playing tricks on me that I can't chant uh, my prescribed rounds anymore. Of course, his body was falling apart, it wasn't his mind, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, you do not have to chant so much anymore, you're old. So you have to, you can listen your chanting. So and then Hari does put in the request. He said, "I know your pastimes are coming to an end soon. So this is a leela that I don't want to witness. So could I please leave soon? You know, he asked him for permission. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu acquiesced. He spoke so nicely, saying, "You've played." You know, I've performed so many pastimes with you, you've protected me in so many different ways, please grant me this request. So the next day, after seeing Lord Jagannath, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went there and Sri Haridas Thakur, he fixed his eyes, he said like a bumblebee on Lord Chaitanya's face, grabbed his lotus feet and in his own will he left his body. So that was the potency of Sri Haridas, he could leave his body when he chose. So then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he picked up his body and he started dancing with the body and Bakreshwara Pandit was singing, Swaradab Dhanada was there and Ramananda Roy and all the great devotees now ecstatically chanting um, the holy names. <coughs> and he was, uh, he had Haridas, he was carrying Haridas to call. And then Swarup Dhammada reminded him that there were so many different processes that had to be done to, you know, for, um, s- different sort of rites. So they uh, took Haridas and then Sri Chaitanya Mabu started going to all the shopkeepers and say, we're having a big feast for Haridas, please give something. And he was walking around, so Swarup Dhammada got him and said, that's okay, we'll organise that too. And they took him. And then he asked everybody to, all the shopkeepers to donate four partners of everything that they had and they organised a huge feast and they had a uh, a huge feast when they uh, put Haridasa's body in the sea and from that point in time Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu declared that the sea is a place of pilgrimage for Haridasa to call, particularly in Jagannath Puri. So so it was uh, a wonderful pastime of um, our Srila Haridasa to call. Um, it's past on this earth. So, um, we just have to conclude here. Does anybody want to say something, add something? Yes? That's correct, yeah. There is a Samadhi, there was a Samadhi on the beach somewhere. I'm not sure if it's still there or not. It's Still there? Yeah. That's a place of pilgrimage where devotees go to. I went there a long time ago. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, I met a man on the Hindu topic. He was saying that Paragraph was the incarnation of the incarnation of the Sorry. He's also the incarnation. Some say he's an incarnation of Narabuni. I have heard Sri Palat somewhere at that point in time, but on the yeah, combination, but principally Bhakti Chiru Maharaj and others have um, stated that this is the purpose of Srila Haridas the court, that as Lord Brahma he would um, taste the nectar of the holy names without being too attached to one name. Uh, name, fame, and prestige. Very nice class. No, thank you very much. I just heard the breakfast gone go, so.
Glory is to Shil Haridas the Guru, or glory to Shil Prabhupada for giving us so much nectar. Don't forget it's the um, Anchanila uh, Volume 4. It's a very beautiful page, like from page 1 to page 50. See if you can read it today. Huh? Um, Anchanila Volume 4, starting from right in the beginning, the passing of Haridas to call that chapter. Okay. Hey, Hare Krishna.